Welcome everybody to this uh, second day of the ECB conference on the monetary policy. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, today Professor Carmen Reinhardt as our as our first uh, keynote uh, speaker, who will deliver a speech on the challenges faced by central banks in normalizing the policy and the related international dimension. So Carmen Reinhardt is the Minos uh, Thombanakis Professor of the International Financial System at Harvard Kennedy School. She is the former senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank Group, and she was also senior policy advisor and deputy director at the International Monetary Fund. These are just uh, some of the very many uh, senior positions held by, by Carmen, both in the public and private institutions along her long and, and very prolific uh, career. In terms of uh, her intellectual influence, let me just uh, mention that uh, based on publications and uh, citations, Carmen, Carmen is uh, regularly ranked among the very top uh, economists worldwide, according to uh, all rankings, uh, including, of course, uh, Repec. Beyond that, uh, she has been listed among Bloomberg Market's most influential 50 in finance, foreign policy's top 100 global thinkers, and Thomson Reuters, the world's most influential scientific minds. Carmen has also been awarded with uh, many recognitions, including the Kim Juan Carlos I Prize in Economics and the National Association of Business Economists Adam Smith Award, among other uh, many recognitions. So thank you very much, Carmen, for uh, being with us uh, today. Without uh, further uh, delay, the, the floor is, is yours. Well, thank you for, for uh wonderful introduction and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, what, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is uh, please call out the PowerPoint just to see, uh, thank you. And we could turn the page um, as, as uh, was was discussed i will be focusing as many of you have yesterday and will continue to do so uh through the remainder of, of today's session uh very much focused on on the very unsettling uh, uh global economic conditions um i will focus in particular since my task is is really to also bring in uh the global dimension what is a very uneven recovery uh, between advanced economies, emerging markets, and, and developing countries um, post-COVID. Uh, well, premature to say post-COVID, but since COVID. Um, the unwelcome return of global inflation, Asia has been comparatively doing better, but as I will discuss, it is indeed a global phenomenon. And then I'm gonna break up the uh, uh, talk really into uh, central bank policies in the advanced economies and the, 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 the challenges faced there, given the levels of debt, given what uh, initial conditions were um, at the outset of the pandemic, and then turn to the global implications, the implications for the global economy of the policy challenges uh, faced by the major uh, central banks as the spillovers uh, via fi global financial markets, as is well known, both in reality and in the economic literature is, is, is uh, can be very and has been historically very substantive those those spillovers from policy changes so i'll focus on risks but let me turn to the next slide and uh really start with just uh, we all know this so i'm speaking to an audience that perhaps i'm um you know this is a redundant slide but i like to start reminding everyone that 2020 was such an exceptional year that if you were to look at the incidents, the share of countries globally that had 
a decline in per capita GDP in 2020, that share is about 90%. And if you put this in historic context, we hadn't seen a phenomenon like this, not even during World War I, during World War II, or during the economic depression of the 1930s, where uh, uh, the, the share of countries uh, that, that had simultaneous synchronous output declines um, uh, uh, didn't quite reach the, the 90% uh, that we hit during COVID. So this is the beginning of the, the global setting. Let me ask to turn the page. Um, and having just returned to Harvard from the World Bank, where I was chief economist there for, for from the onset of the pandemic, uh, one of the most striking uh, features of, of the COVID-19 uh, shock is that it is an exceptionally regressive shock. This is, you know, I followed, like so many of you, very, very, very closely the developments during and after the global financial crisis. And the global financial crisis was called global, but it really was heavily concentrated on the advanced economies, uh, and in particular, about a dozen or so economies that had built up excesses, especially in the housing market, not exclusively. But as a group, as a group, emerging markets and developing countries had a rough you know, during the height of the crisis in late 2008, early 2009, had a rough time, but recovered very quickly, very vigorously. Um, a big engine of growth, as we will discuss later when we look towards the risks, um, uh, was that at that time, uh, in the height of the global financial crisis recession that swept through the United States and much of Europe, um, China was growing double digits. This was a big engine of growth for emerging markets. And the pandemic is a completely different phenomenon. What this table shows is that, well, first of all, a point that I've been making uh, since the onset of the pandemic, a short piece that Vincent Reinhardt, my husband and I did for foreign affairs highlighted that be very careful in confusing rebound with recovery. You know, I noted, uh, of course, the spectacular output collapses on a per capita basis of 2020. Well, you say output went down 10% in 2020 and it came back up 10% uh, in 2021. Well, as we all know, the math of that is that on a per capita basis, you're still below where you were in the pandemic. So recovery has been incomplete and it has been particularly incomplete in um, uh, emerging uh, markets and low income countries. Um, according to the wheel, not the wheel that's just being released. I have, of course, no time given its release date uh, to, to bring these slides up to date, but um, I, this is based on 2021 numbers. Uh, 2021, about 37% of the advanced economies uh, what it, were at a new peak. Indeed, it wasn't just rebound, it was recovery. However, when you went lower down in the income scale, only 20% of the emerging markets and less than 20% of the low income countries had fully recovered uh, their pre-crisis uh, uh, per capita income uh, level. Now, what's worse is that, uh, you know, uh, 
what this means is that for uh, the majority, between 70 and 80 percent of the uh, emerging markets and developing countries um, per capita income entering this year, entering 2022, which has been a difficult year by any measure, uh, has been uh, below uh, prior peaks. Next slide, please. So um, this has meant that, um, you know, the global Gini coefficient uh, has has skyrocketed uh, since the pandemic, and and the point of bringing this up at this conjuncture is that, as we are all aware, aware um, we are facing a very difficult combination of the very high probability of recession in the advanced economies, coupled with exceptionally high inflation, as I will talk about imminently, the highest in uh, 40 years. If you think that it has been bad for advanced economies, initial conditions are even weaker in much of the developing world. I am throwing a lot of countries, very diverse set of countries into one basket. There are commodity producers that are currently benefiting from the, the renewed strength in, in commodity uh, markets, particularly oil. Uh, but as, as a group, uh, emerging markets are certainly, uh, and developing countries have certainly recovered uh, less fully, uh, more, uh, 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 more of the gap that had closed down in the aftermath of the uh, global financial crisis between advanced and emerging has widened again. Next slide, please. So adding to this uneven recovery, uh, what we have is, is really what preoccupies central banks pretty much everywhere. Um, in, in the, the current discourse is the return of global inflation, which had been uh, for a long time uh, presumed debt. What this chart shows, again, before I turn to actual inflation rates, is the share of emerging markets and developing countries and the share of advanced economies that currently, as of September, for those many haven't reported September, so it's really through the 12 months ending in August of this year, um, for about 90% of the countries, whether they're developing, emerging, or advanced, uh, have inflation rates uh, above 5%, which for many uh, of the uh, major central banks is, of course, more than twice uh, the, the uh, targeted range. Um, could we turn uh, to the next page, please? Um, median inflation rates uh, have also uh, uh, spiked dramatically. Let me also say that that chart, the previous chart that you saw with the share of countries, if you extend that share of countries above 5% inflation, um, what percentage, and it's about 90% in the latest reading, um, for the advanced economy group, which is defined along the lines of the world economic outlook, you had to go back to June of 1982 to get such a high incidence of countries having an inflation uh, inflation issue. Um, and, and Similarly, the, the, the median 12-month inflation rates tell a very similar story. And sadly, if one were to point where gaps have narrowed between advanced economies and emerging market, uh, sadly, it has been an in inflation, not because emerging markets are doing well, but because uh, advanced economies 
uh, are doing quite poorly on the score. Next slide, please. At the risk of um, being uh, very, um, you know, saying what we all know, I'll just briefly list um, some of the drivers uh, that are frequently emphasized for the inflation surge. But what I'd like to do next is talk about an issue that I've been talking about that has to do with a less known or a less emphasized dimension of the drivers of inflation, but I'll get to that in a minute. But let me just recap here. Uh, we have a perfect storm. Um, you know, in the US discourse in particular, in the US uh, during 2021 and this year, uh, much of the, the, the discourse has, has focused on overheating that after pumping in massive fiscal stimulus, massive monetary stimulus during uh, the height of the pandemic, um, you had an overheating problem. Um, but but this, this story, as I will argue, doesn't really add up at the global level, okay? Let me, but I will get to that. Of course, there has been every imaginable uh, form of supply chain disruption uh, since the pandemic and continuing to the present, we had what, you know, I referred to this series of children's books, uh, a series of unfortunate events. That's exactly what we have when we thought we were coming out of the pandemic. Uh, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine uh, once again um, created a new wave of, of global disruptions, um, which not only impacted once again supply chains, transport costs, and 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 um, uh, offered a new supply shock. It also came as a supply shock, uh, like the 1970s through commodity prices. Um, and for many emerging markets, this has meant uh, large currency depreciation. I would like to flag one more factor, which is was a major concern uh, and it remains a major concern at both the IMF and the World Bank, uh, which next page, please, which is that during this uh, inflation surge, uh, food price inflation has dramatically spiked. This is not an advanced economy story, but it is a powerful one for many uh, emerging markets and low-income countries, which were exporting, importing their food supplies, their wheat from either the Ukraine, uh, Russia, or a combination of the two. So the combination of oil shock, food price shock, is yet another layer uh, adding to the um, very, um, very regressive shock. What this little hyperbola uh, chart highlights is that the share, if you look at CPI data or whether you look at income expenditure data, you know, household expenditure data, the picture remains the same. Uh, the lower you are in the income strata across countries, the higher the share of food in the consumption basket. And the biggest, the bigger the impact <clears throat> excuse me, of this uh, uh, jump in commodity prices and food prices in particular, the, the, the bigger the impact they have on, on household expenditures. Uh, next slide, please. I'll conclude here uh, on the global inflation surge uh, by just highlighting the point that I made that um, for middle high-income countries, for emerging markets, and for developing countries, the low-income, um, the, the food price story is the most troubling since the food crisis of 2008. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, so I've talked about a, a less than full recovery for most countries, so that per capita incomes in most countries remain below their prior peak. I've talked about the resurgence of inflation, and this brings us to the old, you know, once dusty and forgotten in the back shelf word of stagflation. So to this, to this end, the next slide I'm going to show you divides the world into quadrants, uh, ranging from those that are in the stagflation mode or stagflation risk, uh, those are shown in yellow, uh, to those that uh, the higher levels of inflation are also fortuitously accompanied by a fuller recovery, those are in red. And, um, uh, of course, countries, China being a notable exception, where inflation isn't uh, higher than it was at the outset of COVID, and yet per capita incomes uh, are still above what they were prior to COVID, that's shown in green, uh, are, are, a, um, are the fewer numbers. Uh, let me say that um, the real risk uh, going forward is that most of the countries or many of the countries that are still in red at the moment, that is uh, higher inflation, but also full recovery, maybe there are significant risks that they may slip uh, into recession as 2023 unfolds. So why is this, needless to say, if we're talking about stagflation uh, and uh, central banks have a dual mandate uh, to, to uh, uh, support uh, uh, full employment while providing uh, price stability, uh, that when these are the initial conditions, it becomes a more difficult, challenging uh, task. Adding to that task, next slide, please. Adding to that task, uh, to the difficulty of that task is that advanced economies um, have uh, very, uh, by any historic metric, very high levels of public debt and public debt climbed significantly uh, during COVID. Um, this chart shows public debt as a percent of GDP uh, for for the advanced group, um, and and it flags uh, the U.S. Um, and and this complicates matters, as I will see. I will talk about a debt loop, uh, a monetary policy, as of course tightening financial conditions, higher uh, interest rates, uh, in, increase. Um, uh, the debt servicing burden of the public sector, and in some cases, the more fringe cases uh, may increase also uh, the odds of, of debt distress. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if the uh, situation is, is evident looking at debt to GDP, debt to general revenue um, is, is uh, the increase is even more uh, dramatic uh, than when considering debt to GDP for particularly the United States. So you, when you ask yourself, how, how are uh, our advanced economies going to uh, stabilize uh, debt ratios, um, the usual menu is fiscal tightening, uh, inflation, um, financial repression, uh, outright debt restructuring. Uh, debt restructuring is, of course, much more common in the context of emerging markets than it is in advanced economies, but certainly before World War II, it was hardly unheard of in advanced economies, and of course we had 
the Greek example of uh, privately held debt restructuring uh, after the global financial crisis. And in the case of Portugal and Ireland, we also had debt restructuring of officially held debt. Uh, so, uh, bottom line here is to say, um, if we're considering the challenge pace, uh, faced by tightening monetary policy, uh, those challenges also are there, the strains are there on the fiscal side uh, for many uh, advanced economies and for most, overwhelmingly most emerging markets. Fiscal positions are also strained, so we are looking um, at a situation where uh, fiscal stimulus uh, is, or the, the, the ability to do fiscal stimulus to offset uh, tightening in monetary policy is, is unlikely. Uh, let us turn to the... Um, to the next slide, please. Uh, so, recapping very quickly, uh, many, if not most, of the countries are in the stagflation quadrant, lower uh, per capita income than the prior peak, higher uh, inflation rates than not only in 2019, but in uh, the case of advanced economies higher than in four decades. Um, what about initial conditions on the monetary front? And here I'm going to focus and turn my attention to a driver of inflation and a driver of inflation inertia that often is, I think, underappreciated uh, in the current discourse of inflation, uh, where much of the blame, as we saw earlier on this inflation spike, is connected to a supply shock story, which is certainly there, uh, global supply chains, and to uh, commodity markets and commodity uh, and particular oil shocks. However, the setting um, of the spike in oil prices and continuation of supply shocks was one in which it's important to, to revisit initial conditions. Um, since monetary, since the global financial crisis, monetary policy has had two salient features um, in the advanced economies. Um, one dimension of that feature is characterized by a significant ballooning, there is no other term, of the central bank's holdings of government securities. So a very big expansion in the footprint of the central bank in holding government securities. You really have to go back to World War II to see anything similar uh, to that. So big expansion in the balance sheet. The second feature I'd like to highlight is exceptionally sustained and negative real interest rates, and in the case of Europe also, of course, there was not only negative real exposed interest rates, but real nominal interest rates. Um, so what I have referred to as the current initial conditions for monetary policy tightening that we are living through is a two-step ratchet effect. Um, next slide, please. Um, what this bar chart shows is it shows central bank holdings of government debt as a percent of GDP. It looks the little white bar, which you can barely see, shows the average share uh, pre-global pre financial crisis, um, and obviously pre-COVID. The gray shading shows the share from 2008 to 2019, post-financial, global financial crisis, but pre-COVID. And the black line uh, uses the most recent available uh, 
complete data uh, that I have for, for all the advanced economies. Again, this is the wheel. Um, um, I've highlighted a subset of the countries, but this is a, an exercise done for all the advanced economies. And the salient feature here is that however measured, whether we actually look at this as a share of GDP or whether we look at it as a share of the amount of government debt outstanding, which I'm not showing, but I can guarantee you shows a similar pattern. Uh, there's been a ratchet effect that even though there was 10 years between the global financial crisis of 2009 and the uh, COVID pandemic, um, in, that, in, in those years, um, the correction to the to the prior expansion was was very very modest and left uh, the level the the size of the balance sheet already expanded. Um, enter COVID, and there is another major expansion uh, in uh, the balance sheet. Uh, I you know I I capped it figure at 50%, you know, Japan's ratio, of course, is much higher than that, but I I, um, I, I capped the figure at, at, at 50%. Um, turn to next, next slide, please. And, and putting this in historic context for the US, this goes back to the point that I made earlier. The expansion in bank balance sheets, is not entirely uh, novel, but of course, the periods in which we see a similar expansion uh, in the central bank balance sheet was, of course, the high inflation, high chronic high inflation period of the 1970s. And before that, this data from the flow of funds is quarterly. It starts in 1946, but we had seen uh, significant expansion of central bank balance sheets during the major wars during World War One and World War Two. Uh, so you know, the point I'm making here is we often get very exogenous explanations of why nominal and real interest rates were so low for so long. And these have to do with, um, um, you know, demographics, uh, secular stagnation, um, lower productivity, growth, and so on. Very much in the realm of real factors. But I will make the point, which I've been making for years that in that low low rates low for long era a critical feature that kept red rates low for long was nothing other than the actions the collective actions of the major uh central banks this has relevance of course for where for our our uh, future uh path as we perhaps have to wean ourselves out for the of the low for long uh, era that we lived in since the uh, global financial crisis. Since obviously, given the current inflation rate, it is improbable at a minimum. I'm being very uh, subdued in my remarks here uh, that we will see anything resembling uh, the kind of expansion in in bank balance sheets that we saw in the past, uh, and quite possibly some reversal. Next slide, please. I said there were two salient features uh, of monetary policy since the global financial crisis, and one was the big blowing up of central bank balance sheets, which I have argued kept real interest rates very low for very long. To make the second point that, that the second salient feature is that short-term real interest rates in the global financial centers um, 
seldom, seldom, very seldom in history here. This is from work with Christoph Trevish and Vincent Reinhardt, um, both past and ongoing work um, on long cycles of commodities and capital flows. But if you were to go back to 1815 instead of 1870, you would see the story remains intact. Um, there are only four episodes during this period that spans uh, uh, um, centuries. Um, during this period that spans centuries, um, we only see four episodes of sustained neg significantly negative real interest rates. Uh, World War I. World War II, the 1970s, and the longest period of sustained negative real interest rate is since the global financial crisis to the present, notwithstanding the rise in uh, short-term rates that central banks have recently uh, delivered. However, it is noteworthy, please turn to next page, that uh, the periods that I mentioned, World War I, World War II, the 1970s, uh, were all periods characterized by higher, much higher inflation rates uh, during the negative interest rate spell than during normal. Um, and I would note that exits from previous negative uh, interest rates um, called often for fairly draconian uh, policy actions. And a and this is, I think, uh, the most memorable perhaps of these uh, is uh, October of 1979 when Paul Boker raised short-term interest rates in the US to levels that had not been seen uh, Historically, uh, since the um, since the creation of the Federal Reserve, exits from high inflation, the idea that we can cook, the idea that we can deliver a painless exit and engineer a soft landing. I think the probability of a soft landing and and a smooth exit from these exceptionally low real interest rates and high inflation. Um, historically, the odds of that, that smoother transition are a low probability event. Um, in the late 1990s, of course, we had an episode in the which the Federal Reserve tightened. You had a, uh, you know, um, successful reduction in inflation and and without an accompanying recession. Uh, but I would highlight that the uh, inflation rate in the 19, uh, late 1990s, 97, 98 episode, uh, it, mid 1990s to, to late 1990s, sorry, I misspoke, it's 94, 95, um, in that episode, uh, the the inflation picture was very benign with inflation below 4% relative to where it is today. So bottom line of what I'm saying is apart from all the shocks listed earlier, supply shocks, commodity shocks, and the like, the setting for this inflation surge has important roots on a very sustained, prolonged, aggressive, monetary expansion that produced exceptionally uh, negative uh, and sustained real interest rates, ex post real interest rates, and in many cases nominal as well, and exiting from that uh, without significant economic disruptions is going to be a tall order. So I, that, let, let me move on to that. Um, and and um, I would uh, go to the next page, please. Um, and 
this and with this I will conclude the discussion of the uh, advanced economies and quickly turn to uh, what this implies for emerging markets. Um, protracted negative or very exceptionally low real interest rates have encouraged overborrowing by both the government and the private sector. Uh, it has also often, often, often fueled risk taking in the search for yield. Um, and, you know, while other things equal, these negative or very low, exceptionally low uh, nominal and real interest rates seemingly improved the government balance sheet by keeping debt servicing costs very low. Let me say that off balance sheet, uh, negative real interest rates have also had uh, uh, <coughs> raised greater challenges for things like pension fund solvency. Um, negative interest rates have not been a substitute for, for you know, uh, are not a substitute for fiscal discipline um, and I think have facilitated a delay in restoring fiscal discipline for many advanced economies. Um, and, you know, their negative real interest rates, I think, have acted importantly uh, to delay uh, some of the pressures on uh, the need to tackle debt issues in more uh, um, fragile cases, such as Italy and Greece. Next slide, please. Uh, so, you know, I think central banks in the advanced economies, and I will stop here with the advanced economies, have, you know, the issue of how do you exit this debt loop in which uh, we've had low for long leading to higher leverage, more risky positions, more risk on positions, uh, the concern of asset price bubbles, US equity market, many renewed signs of bubbly uh, real estate markets. Um, and how do you uh, exit from that um, without breaking eggs? And I think what I'd like to leave you with in this section is that exit um, from this environment uh, may be protracted. In other words, central banks may falter um, as they did in the 1970s, that as tightening takes its toll on the economy, central banks worried about either financial fragility because of asset price bubble bursts or because of high leverage uh, or because more importantly uh, contraction and economic activity get cold feet and don't fully sustain the the, the course to to reduce inflation this this cold feet problem was an issue in the 1970s is it did a short piece on the Federal Reserve history with Ken Rogoff that, that addresses the policy inertia. I think we, we may be vulnerable to that again. Now this setting, and I will spend some time now, uh, but uh, uh, hopefully allow also for about 10 minutes of questions. Please, next slide. This tightening in monetary conditions that is required uh, to bring inflation down as historically um, uh, uh, post significant risks for uh, emerging markets um, through various channels. First off, um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the debt challenge for emerging markets is as big and in some cases in particularly in middle to low and low income countries 
much greater uh, for developing countries and for advanced economies. At the moment, even before the recent increases in interest rates, um, uh, there has been a surge uh, in, 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 in debt servicing costs and in, and in debt in emerging markets. Um, I would note that among the 73 uh, middle to low income countries that were eligible for the debt service suspension initiative during COVID, uh, more than half of them at the moment either are either deemed by the IMF and World Bank as it being in either debt distress or near debt distress. Um, so uh, the round of, of, of tightening of international financial conditions also has very important consequences for sovereign risk. Uh, and this is, and I'm not being melodramatic here. I'm not talking about we're back to the early 1980s and the Volcker era and Mexican default of August of 1982. I'm not talking about something that gloom and doom, but the risks uh, that more marginal uh, cases, um, uh, given the very high debt levels, because as you see, debt looks like a U shape uh, for uh, emerging and, and, and low income countries. Um, there are many sovereign debt challenges that I think lie ahead. Next slide, please. And um, I would note that, and I will go quickly so we have time for, for questions, um, that the um, increase, what this shows is debt servicing as a percent of exports. And, you know, we talk about low for long, but we also have to ask low for whom? Even in the low interest rate era that we are exiting from at the moment, emerging markets as a group, as this chart shows, already faced rising debt servicing costs. Uh, it is true, one good positive note is that as a group, emerging markets and, and, and low-income countries and developing countries have a lower share of short-term debt than they did in the past, which makes them better poised to deal with rising interest rates. But at the same time, I would note that variable rate debt uh, is also, of course, a, a source of concern and that is approaching uh, its previous highs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these countries, so in addition to the challenges faced by the advanced economies that uh, you have to have an inflation fighting tighter monetary stance that increases the risk of not a soft landing, but a uh, uh, recession. Uh, emerging markets, in addition to all of those combinations, um, also face uh, very real concerns that the decline in poverty reduction, which had already stalled before the pandemic, is now being reversed. So that, and this is also, by the way, fueled by the uh, impact of the Russia-Ukraine war and its impact on food prices, as I noted earlier. So emerging markets uh, face the past usual risk of rising risk premium, reduced capital flows. Many emerging markets right now are being bolstered by high commodity prices because they're commodity producers. But I think we are also uh, entering a very risky period uh, uh, as uh, this combination of high inflation, uh, dimmer growth, uh, higher debt is also coupled with uh, signs of rising poverty and, and, and the handmaiden of that, which is civil unrest. On that upbeat note, let me end my remarks. Thank you very much, Carmen, for this very 
rich and uh, comprehensive uh, speech. I mean, you touch uh, upon many, many issues, including the the many complexities that uh, central banks are facing today uh, when normalizing their their monetary their monetary policy. So we have some some uh, minutes for uh, uh, collecting some some questions from the from the floor. Uh, here I see one. Please use the the Q and A facility in the in the Webex uh, app. So one question here is from uh, from Klaus Mashuk uh, from the from the ECB. Uh, so the question is is the following, Carmen. What are your considerations on the sequencing of the exit from low real rates and large central uh, banks' balance sheets in advanced economies? Should balance sheets ring swiftly now, or should this wait until policy rates have been normalized? Uh, and a second uh, related question is, how should the ACB deal with increasing risk premium in sovereign deals in some member, uh, in some member states of the, of the euro area? So, uh, Carmen? So... This is really a critical question, and it's, it's um, it has to do. One has to do. I mean, it's not just sequencing; it's timing. When is the right moment? I I I have been arguing for a long time that a stitch in time saves nine, uh, and I have been arguing this for a long time. So I think the idea that at this stage, let's wait for better circumstances um, only allows the accumulated problem to worsen. Uh, and let's, and, and there is a fiscal analog to that as well. Let's wait, uh, you, you don't wanna tighten fiscal policy during a recession, but it would seem that during recovery, uh, compelling reasons of why you wouldn't tighten fiscal policy in, re in recoveries either, that what I'm saying is making the policy action state contingent. One can always make an argument that the current state is not the appropriate one for action. So I, I, I think I'm pretty unambiguous when it say, you know, when I say that uh, delay in the, se in the 70s made the inflation problem more chronic, more built in. Um, well, the second part of the question, which is squarely on what, what do you do about rising risk premium? That's a tough pill. And, and that's when I talked about the debt loop, uh, and I mentioned, you know, that during the period of exceptionally low for long interest rates, uh, this kept at bay a lot of the concerns, uh, for, for the more vulnerable countries. Um, you know, large ECB purchases, uh, large central bank purchases in general, facilitated uh, rollover risk, facilitated issuing new debt. Um, look, I, I, I would put it to you that uh, it is, I know, easier said than done, um, but uh, the, the mandate of the central bank is inflation or, or stabilization of the output gap or a combination of these two, however you weight them. Um, you know, targeting uh, risk, risk spreads cannot be among them any more than, and of course, having said this, we know there's a Fed put. Uh, you know, it used to be the Greenspan put, it used to be the Bernanke put, and now it's just a Fed put. Similarly, uh, uh, you know, there are risks with bursting an equity price bubble in terms of big wealth effects and so on. Uh, but those are, uh, my concern is that those very factors, fears of these risks, fears of, of a bubble, fear, fears of triggering uh, a debt problem in the context of Europe or, a, an, or an equity market crash in the case of the U.S. or a corporate, uh, you know, high yield corporate debt uh, default stress in the case of the U.S. as well, uh, that those would be deterrents to tightening and that they may indeed uh, give central banks cold feet. Uh, but remember, we do have experience with cold feet, and it was not a good one in the 1970s. 
Thank you, Carmen. Uh, another second question from other ECB colleague, in this case, uh, Carlo Altavira, is the following. Would you have any uh, consideration to offer on the distributional consequences of the protracted period of low policy rates uh, before the, before the uh, pandemic? For instance, across income, uh, gender, educational levels, etc. And if so, how this uh, then uh, would uh, relate to the current uh, conditions? So, so look, uh, let me, I, through my talk, I, you know, leaned heavily on making the point that many of the shocks have been regressive in nature. Uh, and I emphasize deliberately, because of the international dimension, the regressive dimension across countries. But the very same arguments, and I will talk about real interest rates in a moment, but let me start with inflation and food prices in particular. The very same patterns that I alluded to, the, the, the regressive nature of inflation, the regressive nature of spiking food prices that we see across countries, we see across income groups. So if you do expenditure surveys and you look at household um, uh, expenditures, the same nonlinearity uh, is there. And, and what I'm getting at, uh, there are distributional effects of negative real interest rates. I will mention those in a second. But do not forget by any means uh, that the inflation tax, which you know had been uh, uh, thought dead and buried for a long time, uh, inflation is a very regressive tax relative price changes that have accompanied the inflation spike, food and energy, are very regressive. So dealing with that has important consequences for, for distributional effects. Uh, let me say, you know, the era of low negative uh, exposed real interest rates was an era, and I, in all my work on financial repression, we started in 20, 2010. Uh, I've alluded to this. Uh, financial repression and sustained negative real interest rates are a transfer from savers to borrowers. I cannot speak to uh, the gender dimension, but I can speak to uh, the intergenerational or the across income category. So, uh, you know, negative real interest rates did make it easier for for. Uh, households that have more difficulty typically accessing credit to access credit uh, certainly made it easier for governments to borrow and governments also have you know can affect redistributive effects um, and uh, made it more difficult however for one type of fixed income uh, you know, retirees. So it, it had a, it on the whole favored the younger. Real interest, high real interest rates, of course, will have generational transfers going the other way, right? It is not the old who need to borrow for housing. Uh, and, and so, you know, it, it you know, I, I, there, there are troubling issues with the redistributive effects of moving from exceptionally low to more normal interest rates. But let us not forget the big elephant in the room, which is inflation is a very regressive tax. Thank you, Carmen. Let me let me pose a last uh, question to, to you. I mean, I'm sure you are aware of a recent uh, contribution by uh, Maurice Osfeld, who was calling for a higher degree of uh, coordination uh, by the major central banks uh, around the world. Uh, when tightening their monetary their monetary policy, you know? the idea, of course, is that uh, they should uh, internalize to a, to a larger degree than seen so far uh, their own actions on the rest of the of the big players, in order, as the argument goes, in order to uh, reduce uh, the probability of uh, ending up in a situation in which uh, the degree of tightness of uh, monetary policy at the global level is is too is too high, is too uh, uh, restrictive. No, so. Uh, I would like to know your opinion on this on this argument, and in particular, are you worried about the possibility of ending up in a kind of uh, a situation in which uh, monetary policy at the global level is uh, too tight, uh, precisely because 
major central banks do not internalize that uh, most of them or all of them are tightening at the same time? So it is an excellent point, um, both on the internalizing the risks that they create for the rest of the world is, is an important point. Um, it connects actually beautifully also to the first question. And let me put it to you why. Uh, delay, and this goes back to the first question on timing and sequencing. Um, Uh, as I showed in one of the charts that looked at central bank balance sheets, you saw that advanced economies since the global financial crisis have moved as a herd. Okay, they, they've moved in, in unison. Uh, you know, you had a wave of, of easing, not exactly perfectly coordinated, but, but they, they, there has been co significant co-movement. Uh, and it, once again, in, during COVID. Um, I think that one question related to Maury's point is if we collectively see them move in the other direction, will the pendulum swing so much that they create another uh, emerging market debt crisis like the infamous one of the lost decade of the 1980s? Okay. Uh, and I alluded to that when I talked about uh, the, the Paul Volcker tightening, the fact that there had been, it had been delayed, that there had been repeated milder attempts to tighten, but that the longer it delayed, the more cumulative the inflation challenge became. Inflation was close to 14% in the U.S. Uh, when Volcker slammed the brake in October of 79. And when he slammed the brake, because inflation was so high, it also meant a much bigger spike in interest rates. How does this relate to uh, uh, Maury's point? Uh, well, uh, it cannot be said that in terms of inflation reduction, uh, the Volcker policy was extremely successful in the U.S., uh, it ushered in a very sharp and, and, and rapid decline in inflation. In terms of what it did to global capital markets, well, it ushered in the last decade for emerging markets, you know. Uh, 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 so so I, I, I think the points being made about internalizing global effects uh, is something that should be discussed. However, if you ask me what the historic experience has been and what central banks and governments are prone to do, they're worried about the local ph phenomenon rather than the global one. Uh, so it's hard for me at this moment, at this conjuncture, to oversee a situation in which the global consequences are internalized to an extent uh, that uh, they dominate uh, global conditions, which may mean that um, uh, if there are delays to tightening, uh, if tightening has to be more draconian, their real risk, which I worry about all the time, uh, the real risk that it can engender very substantive crises uh, across emerging markets, it's a very real, it's a very real scenario. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Carmen. So this brings us to the to the end of this uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, keynote uh, speech and subsequent uh, uh, discussion. So let me just uh, thank you uh, once uh, once more time uh, for your availability, uh, uh, Carmen. It was really a pleasure to, to have you here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you.